The first spring of COVID-19, 2020, the year the word pandemic entered everyday speech and toilet paper became a prized possession. If we were lucky, it only emptied our streets, our schools, our social lives. If we weren't, it emptied our families and our wallets. The lucky ones could just transition to work at home. The rest had to put their very lives at risk, commuting to the essential jobs that kept folks fed and cared for. Audible has collaborated with The Loop Lab on a series of pieces about COVID-19 and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. In this piece, John Ravenel Jr. of The Loop Lab talks with a number of members of the Boston area Black community to learn about how they met the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and how they found their resilience to keep on going. These conversations took place over Zoom or, if in person, under the best social distancing practices. Interviewees are Troy Ellerby of Pentecostal Tabernacle, G. Ja of the Black Cotton Club, Joy Riley, a freelance hairdresser, Ezra McDowell, a freelance videographer, and Chris Hope and Moses Michelle, co-founders of The Loop Lab. Yeah, this is a six foot ruler, so tape measure. We're about nine feet apart, I think it's safe to take the mask off. My name is Troy Ellaby. I work at uh, Pentecostal Tabernacle in Cambridge. When COVID started, put me in a place to react like one would react with a pending storm that you're watching for, you know, a, a blizzard, for lack of a better word. The, you, you see from afar that this blizz, blizzard's heading your way. Go through a, 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 a list of what, are, what is it that it's gonna take to sustain through the storm, right? What, what changes need to be made to keep people safe within the facilities? So that's, that's been the biggest change. So my name is Jija, first name Priscilla, founder of a beautiful and very sacred space called Black Cotton Club. really just creates a space where people tell their stories um, and sing their songs and share their poems and share their whatever is going on. My performances, Black Cotton Club, teaching requires me to be in front of people, requires a call and response, requires people to answer questions in the same room. Um, and to transition everything to virtual was very, very tough we are now facing is what does it really mean to have now a jam session and we haven't answered it honestly we're still trying stuff so you know <laughs> i had the opportunity to speak with two self-driven entrepreneurs of color that freelance their skill in boston my intentions was to dig deeper to learn what obstacles have they had to overcome to move forward my name is Joy Riley. I am 25 years old and I'm a hairstylist. Um, before COVID, I was and still am doing hair. I love making people feel good about themselves. I love seeing people happy and pleased with their appearance. I was actually in hair school and I dropped because I just, I lacked the confidence to, to keep going. I didn't believe in myself. I wasn't sure if anybody else really believed in me. So. There was many times throughout my hairstyle career that I've given up for a little bit and jumped right back in because I've always been called to do it. So. My name is Ezra McDowell <laughs> and I run McDowell Media. <laughs> From when I was a young age, like I was seven years old, I was into technology heavy. I would bring stuff home. I would build my own stuff. I wasn't into having new stuff. I would always destroy it and make something else out of it. And then it kind of, you know, molded its way into me doing video production and doing it's an audio production and fixing technology. You know, I threw it out there too, here or there, like, hey, you know, you're trying to get out better content. I see you shooting stuff with your phone. Oh yeah, oh, I'll come by, I'll come by. Never happened. Not even my own church even brought me in. They're still shooting from their cell phone. Even I offered it to them. And a Spanish church down on Blue Hill Avenue, they don't even speak English. They speak Portuguese and Spanish. They let me in. <laughs> and they paid me to shoot their service. And the service came out amazing. They're pulling 2K, 3K viewers on a Sunday. I think they pulled next to 6K 
um, on Mother's Day. I don't even think that congregation is that big. <laughs> and they're pulling those type of numbers. So I'm like, this is, this is what could happen. Soon after, I spoke with Chris Hope and Moses Michelle, co-founders of The Loop Lab, to discuss with them what focuses should we have to better serve underprivileged Black communities in Boston and Cambridge. Really, my purpose in life has always been advancing for those who are most more vulnerable in our society and advancing rights, human rights, civil rights, uh, opportunities. And I think that the Loop Lab, for me at least, is another permutation of that. When we talk about the gross underrepresentation of black and brown folks in the media arts industries and the audio video industries, at the same time being able to try to scaffold the foundational resources and knowledge that is needed in order for people of color to really enter into a lot of those spaces and to be able to feed their families, provide for themselves. What I've always really pushed for is access. So um, when I start to look around and see a lot of my peers, they didn't have access either. It's like, yeah, what, what is that that person has that like, you know, or these groups of people have that we don't have? And how can we, how can we get that? And so, um, and so really moving into spaces in which I could find individuals who, who are willing to share how to, um, how to gain access and, um, and what that means. And what am I not naming is that graduating high school didn't necessarily mean that I would get the job that I wanted. And, um, and yeah, graduating college meant the same thing. So like, I'm like, okay, well, what, what is this weird in between that, um, that like, you know, we're not getting, and it's this thing called workforce development, like, you know, and that's where the loop lab comes in. Right. Um, and that's where like really thinking about, Hey, how do we build our resumes? Like, what does this look like? You know, um, these were all things that I was, I was constantly trying to find for my peers and for myself growing up in a space that like, you know, that is systemically, systemically created to keep people the way they, the way they, they they are like a great example. If I grew up in, in, um, in public housing, I have. I realized that um, that I can't make a certain amount of money, otherwise they're gonna shoot up the rent on my mother. So I can get a job, but I can't get a, a job that's too good, because then my mom loses her house. Teaching young people, um, young adults, I will say, like in in that space, because that uh, that's the young adulting part of your life. It's it's hard to make that jump, right? Um, I I'll say that like you know it's it's very easy that someone's like, honestly, like this is really uncomfortable for my style of living. And that's a challenge. Because many of them have been forced to be effective with limited resources prior to this epidemic, they have found unique opportunities and a strong mental attitude to be resilient in their circumstance. So I asked them to share some wisdom that would encourage someone else in a similar circumstance as them. Here's what they had to say. You know, I have a personal mantra, which is uh, focus your light. And the idea is just like a laser that's just focused light. Similarly, there, there's an energy within all people. And I think that you have to, you know, be able to be self-aware and to believe in yourself and have that confidence in your abilities to make change and create change in order to focus your light, despite whatever might be happening around you or happening to you. So if there is a challenge, it's not seeing it as something that's going to block you. It's seeing as, um, it's seeing something as an opportunity to, to move forward and grow from. So, um, and having something called stick to uh, that's, that's resilience. Just believe in yourself wholeheartedly. Um, perfect your craft, whatever it is. Try new things, learn from what, where you mess up, where you made mistakes, learn from those, and, you know, just believe in yourself and try. Um, always think outside of the box. I know it's very cliche, but it's like seeing the bigger picture to a lot of things really zones you in when you're stuck inside of this little corner and you can't even see past the bend. It creates a barrier around you where you feel like, oh, there's nothing besides what's in this box when there's a whole bigger picture out there. I think that we are all equipped with 
the tools um, that we need to operate in this life. Um, it doesn't require knowledge of any kind. And I think that the more that we trust this wisdom that we've been blessed with, the wisdom that is within our own hearts, our own mind, our own body, um, I think we'll be, we'll be able to like really get answers or, or even be able to fall in love with the question. We go through challenges and um, trusting in God allows me uh, to, to the weather the storm. And then once we get to the other side of the storm, being able to look back and saying, we did it by God's grace, thank you. That's, that's, that's what resilience is to me. Greatness is forged in trial and tribulation. Resilience is a skill that gets sharpened all too often. But it does demonstrate our strength and give us hope. Together we will get through this and we'll never be the same again. Let's hope we will be stronger for it.